And for Brad Hughes, your players champion from 2014, looking for an invitational win here. One already has his invite for the players championship as the returning champion. We start out, Brad's on the play, just with a forest tap land for Jack. First, some of these early development turns from Brad will be how many mana creatures can he have? Rattleclaw Mystic, Carry Added, Elvish Mystic, all four ofs in his deck. Even the main deck Ugin here that Jack has, not that he's gunning for Green Devotion necessarily, but that's Good. another problematic yep. card in this matchup for Brad. All right, now Brad knows what he's up against. Here's the Temple of Enlightenment to join Temple of Deceit, so it is going to be an Esper deck. You see Sylvan Carriata was the turn two play for Brad. The red splash in his deck, very light, just three Atarkas and two Xenagos in the main. Does he have that Xenagos? It's one of the, re it would be a real important card to get down right now. Xenagos ahead of schedule is a, a good recipe against Esper Dragons and control decks in general. Not the easiest card for them to remove. Only two copies of Heroes Downfall in Jack's list. He's not equipped to attack this card very effectively, obviously. He's got, playing a couple of expensive dragons. You gotta think this is the last Shields down turn, really. And for Brad, no, it's mana creatures. It's a Morph and an Elvish Mystic. The Morph is Rattleclaw Mystic. He does not have any threat to ramp into just yet. I think he has a Genesis Hydra in hand, and he's hoping to set up for that next turn. So this is uh, another problem now. With Brad's draw being this mana heavy, it's not even just about Perilous Vault, although that's a really bad case scenario if it shows up at any point. Even cards like Dissolve are going to be problematic for Brad to beat. Now keep in mind, if you are familiar with the interaction with Genesis Hydra, when you get a free card off Genesis Hydra, the card that Genesis Hydra brings along is not counterable. Yeah. So if Brad gets something very good off that, he'll sneak it by Jack's counter magic. It's just a trigger. Now, Jack can still counter the Genesis Hydra itself. Right. But whatever comes along with Genesis Hydra, that that's not be play. countered. I mean, you have to think that Brad thinks, I would think if I'm in his spot, that he's running into either a Silumgar Scorn or a Nullify in this situation. Or it, it's, you know, maybe an ultimate price. We'll see if Brad respects this enough to leave up one mana when he Hydras or if he's going to Hydra for the full amount. I bet he still goes for the whole thing. Yeah. So here's Rattleclaw making. So we have one, two, three, four. We have eight mana this turn. Big ramping for, for Brad. Because it's not just about playing around Slumgar score, and it's playing around Slumgar score with no dragon in hand. And that's a pretty narrow set of circumstances to play around. Looks like Brad might be doing it. it to me, the, the critical number here is seven. Seven opens up Hornet Queen. And it opens up Dragonlord Atarka. Well, it, it's for five because you have to pay the green green. So it still opens right. up Whisperwood. Yeah, it's as five, Genesis Hydra for five and Genesis Hydra for seven are yes. the important flashpoints. So if it's for six, he might be decide it's worth playing around Slumgar Scorn a little bit. So it was for five. He did not. I think Whisperwood was the card he wanted to see. He's not going to get it. The best card he can get is Corsair. He has a choice between Corsair, Elvish Mystic, and Death Mist Raptor. Based on this hand, Brad needed to hit off that, and I don't feel like he did. No. Whisper would be would be a huge deal. We'll see the card he missed out on. No, actually we won't. He'll shuffle. We'll never know. Corsair will be the selection. We'll see Brad's top card. Now the course is going to resolve. We the, the Genesis Hydra is still on the stack. Next card is Pelucranos World Eater. So Brad making threats, but they are all kind of creatures. We see Nullify takes care of the Hydra. And a swing for two, Jack's down to 19. But yeah, one card like Crux of Fate, one Perilous Vault is gonna be real, is, could be enough just by itself. Yeah, I mean, Brad's done a lot of stuff, but at the end of the day, he's got a slow clock. He's got five points of damage on the table, no reach in the deck, really. Yeah, and that five points of damage you're talking about, that to me seems to be the problem. Jack's hand is actually not too great. He has a Dissolve, I think he has a Silumgar the Drifting Death in his hand. That's his way of stabilizing, but against only five damage a turn, that that may just be fine. Yeah. Pelucranos the draw for Brad, card in waiting as Dragonlord Atarka. And it's another Genesis Hydra from Brad. This one for five again. Can he hit Whisperwood? Yes, this time he can. Can't put it down fast enough. Yep. It's a really important way of him getting to apply more pressure while not overextending much further into a sweeper. Dissolve will hit the Genesis Hydra. This is the best. So Genesis Hydra is probably the most important card in the matchup for Brad. Yep. Just pretty good against counter spells, pretty good against one for one removal spells. Yep. You see Atarka, his top card again. And Corsair puts Jack down to 17. 
This is hard. Jack will need... This puts a lot of pressure on Jack to have Perilous Vault. You see Jack manifests the Atarka. Top card is now Xenagos. Another way of Brad diversifying his portfolio of aggression a little bit. Sure. Can Jack find that Perilous Vault? Draws Bile Blight. That won't be any help. And despite the fact that he has played counter spells the last two turns, he's fallen very far behind because of these Hydras. Yep. And even it looked like possibly Slumgar would be good enough to stabilize this game if Jack had some counter spells or some removal spells. A lot of Brad's forces at the time were once up his creatures, and uh, Brad wasn't equipped to attack through. But now with Whispered Elemental in play, Slumgar is not the answer that it was a, a turn ago. Yeah, multiple Genesis Hydras have done just a lot of damage. So you go back over, see, looks like another counter spell, dragons and lands in Jack's hand. Nothing terrible. If Brad's plays were not Genesis Hydras, Jack would have been able to counter both the spells there. Mm -hmm. And Brad wouldn't have anything to show for it. He'd still just be sitting on a pile of three mana creatures. You know, there would be no Corsair, there would be no Whisperwood. Zena goes to draw for Brad, top card's Corsair. And it looks like he may, even though despite the mull to six, he may steal game one off Jack. Yep. Big, big upset here for Brad. Didn't look like he actually had even that great of a draw. It was just a lot of mana, but two copies of Genesis Hydra, especially the second one yielding a Whisperwood Elemental, may give Brad enough punch here. The thing about Jack's deck is it's very good at having generic answers. Cards like Dissolve, Silumgar Scorn, Hero's Downfall, Nullify, but it, it generally can only play one per turn. So if you're producing multiple threats per turn, it is hard for Esper Dragons to catch up. Right. And that's really what we're seeing. Now, if Jack had Perilous Vault, he would be able to play this a lot differently. He would just be able to tap out for Perilous Vault mm -hmm. and sort of manage things from there. But it has to be Vault, not even Cruxipate because of Whisperwood Elemental. Yeah. Brad's play for turn is Xenagos the Reveler. If Jack has any hope of getting this, he, he can't let that one resolve. And you can see why Brad feels like the matchup is so bad. Even as far ahead as he's gotten in this game, Perilous Vault could still undo all of this. I agree. Silumgar Scorn shows Silumgar the Drifting Death. So no Xenagos. And now you wonder, okay, well, there's going to be a, a Silumgar for Jack. It's not... He's going to take a lot of damage. And to be fair, he probably loses, but it's not certain. Yeah. Silumgar makes... Silumgar's a very good wall. And swing from Brad with all the mana creatures and the Whisperwood. That's an attack of nine. And he manifests the top card. And another Whisperwood waits. Jack's down to seven, and that will be it. Brad Nelson takes game one. Got to be thrilled. Up one zero. Remember, this is these are the X3 bracket, which we've been showing you. That was Kent Ketter's match last round. This Brad Nelson's this round. The winner of the loser of this is going to be out of top eight. Yeah, the rest of the way, we're just basically going to be showing elimination matches. We're going to be in the X2-1, X3, X3-1 bracket, and the loser of all these matches are going to be out for top eight. All right, these players get ready for sideboard. You may be noticing that we have our pins on as we have them doing in coverage. They have switched if you've been very very observant, and that's because these pins are with Star City Games Game Night. So we have the bunny pins. Those are the pins for June. So how this works is you find a store nearby you that does StarCityGames.com Game Night. You can make any tournament of the week into a Star City Game Nights and get exclusive foils and pins shipped to the store, given away at the tournament. You can find out about this more at StarCityGames.com. We have one for every month. So this month is June, so we are giving away the bunny tokens and pins which is great. He's a militaristic bunny. He's count, he kind of has a war council with the other bunnies where they're, they're making a plan. Trying to get to those carrots. We have the July pin ready to go here, which is the piglet. Too late for your store to get signed up for July. But if you want to get signed up for August, we got that kit ready to go. The monkey here, starcitygames.com slash game night or contact your Star City Games organized play representative. I like just, just how happy they all are. Look at him. He's just, he's thrilled to have so many bananas. Yeah. Oh, he's living it up. Life could not get much better. All right. Let's look at the sideboard here. So on Brad's side, Genesis Hydra looks great. I mean, if he has he has three in the main deck, doesn't have a fourth in the sideboard. So I'm sure he would play as many as he could. So other cards, though, we have Den Protector, Nissa World Waker, Nylea's Disciple, Arc Lightning, Morzenagos, Ugin the Spirit Dragon, Plummet, Arbor Colossus, and Hornet Nest. 
I'm thinking he wants high impact cards. What are you looking at? So the cards that I like for sure in this matchup are the additional copy of Zendigos, the Dead Protector, and two copies of Nissa. Those are all great tools against Esper Dragons. Then there's a couple fringe options here. Two copies of Plummet are narrow. They do answer the dragons, but uh, it is taking away from his devotion count and all that kind of stuff. And I think the one copy of Ugin could come in. It's obviously not great against counter spells. It's a lot of mana, but uh, I think Brad might be in the market for just kind of more power and more things that get away from creatures that all get swept up by Crux of Fate. Yeah, and that really does seem to be what you're looking at. You you picked all the Planeswalkers out of a sideboard, and so they're all on the table here. Exactly. On the other side of the table, Jack, two negates, two self-inflicted wounds, a Crux of Fate, two copies of Dragon Lord's prerogative, two copies of Thoughtseize, Virulent Plague, two copies of Drown Sorrow, two Bioblight, Fantasticer. I Love really it. like the two copies of self-inflicted wound here, the Crux of Fate, and the two copies of Thoughtseize especially getting Genesis Hydra out of the hand preemptively. Very, very important. I mean, Brad is a ramp deck. Thoughtseize is just great against them. Uh, and his deck just continues to get better after Cyborg. He can board out things like Dragonlord's Prerogative, um, Bioblight. I, I feel like once he gets to this point, he doesn't actually have to care about the fact that there's mana creatures in Brad's deck. Now, if, if he goes away from... The, does he still want all cards like, self, like Foul Tongue Invocation? That's one I'm not as sold on here. I think that card's not that efficient. It could easily be removed from the deck. I think he's got some other cards that are, you know, on the fringes here as well. And he's not really bringing in that many cards at the end of the day. If he doesn't want self, and if he doesn't want foul tongue invocation, then self inflicted wound is also kind of questionable. It's, it's, it's a lot more play, efficient. It's like you play all. I mean, sacrifice effects get better with more sacrifice right. effects. I feel like maybe you bail on all that stuff, or maybe you keep it all in. But it, it would be weird to me to have a bunch of self inflicted wounds and cut the foul tongue invocations. Yeah, sure. it's, it's different in terms of mana. Um, but I feel like the first couple of edicts are eating mana creatures, and then after that, you're getting to things of substance. So it's, uh, to me, an all or nothing proposition. And I respect saying nothing. I'm going to beat this guy with Crux of Fate, Counter Spells, and Perilous Vaults, let him have all the mana creatures he wants, and I'll sweep everything away at some point. That's a path that I can totally see Jack taking. Jack will be on the play for game two. We said this is possibly Brad's worst matchup, but he has taken game one. It's really important. And Jack's on a mulligan for game two. Can Brad sneak by here? Yeah. We saw Matt Costa play near one of his worst matchups last round against Kent Ketter, and he almost snuck it past Kent. I mean, it, it, you know, we're only playing two or three games at the end of it. And even your, uh, to, to be able to top an invitational, you are going to have to get through bad matchups. No one just runs through your ideal matchups for 16 rounds. Looks like Brad may be contemplating a mulligan of his own. Because Jack's presented and ready to go. Your sideboard cards come up, people mulligan at the right times, you draw the right portion of your deck, but yep. you don't just have 16 good matchups in top eight invitational. That's not how that works. You could only wish that would happen. All right. Jack looks like he's up. He's okay with the six. He turns the deck, and we are underway with game two. Jack's going to start out on some tap lands. It's Opulent Palace. I'm wondering if he plays any green. The answer is no. They play that just because they want extra blue-black duels. The mana comments are very heavy for the deck with Bioblight and Silver Scorn, and they play Havens. Yeah, Nullify and Bioblight. Okay, find every duel land you can get your hands on, <laughs> put them all on your deck. Just the one palace, or are we even on more now? I One copy of Opulent Palace. All right. And a Temple joins it. But only three copies of Temple of Enlightenment, which really tells you how strict the black and blue requirements are that they're... Sure. The deck plays with white cards. So if you're cutting a Temple of Enlightenment for an Opulent Palace, that says a lot about the deck's mana requirements. Brad with two Temples to start the game. And this, to me, feels like a victory for Jack because now he's reached the point where at three mana, all of his one-for-one -one trading removal is just going to be online and Brad has no board to show yet. Now, Jack is minus two cards, but even then, that may not be that big of, an, big of a deal. Brad plays a morph. Jack has Foul Tongue Invocation in hand, just lets it be. That, that one's interesting to me if he doesn't have a sweeper, because eventually this Foul Tongue just has to tag that card, right? Yeah, well, if he's not casting it right now, it means he's playing towards a sweeper. Don't know if he has one in hand already, but that's the only rationalization. You usually just edict the first thing that shows up unless you're going to play a sweeper and then use the edict to take care of the leftovers. Here's a swing. Vogel down to 18. And it does look like there's a crux of fate in Jack's hands. 
And how much do you sniff this out of your Brad? It seems so, so Jack would have the option of dissolves, heroes downfalls, Slumgar scorns, nullifies, foul tongues, and he did none of those tier three drop. This, that is suspicious. Yeah, for sure. But Brad also can't just attack for two every turn and win the game that way. So he's sure. got to deploy enough of his hand to force the action on Jack's side of the table without losing any critical elements. And, right. and Corsair is probably good enough to get it done. Corsair will, will work here. It shows Nissa World Waker actually on top of the deck. So if Jack taps out for Crux of Fate, that is, that is difficult. Yeah. Because that means Nissa will be on board. And Nissa is one of the most problematic cards for blue-black control decks. Sure, draw the turn. Hero's Downfall was the draw for the turn. That might soften the blunt of a Nissa, and I think it does enough that he'll just Crux. Yeah. But he still has to beat the 4-4 on the leftovers. Even if Jack has an answer to Nissa, it's still likely to be productive. All right, Corsair is taken down, and Death Mist Raptor was the other card. I like Brad playing that face down to disguise it as a Den Protector. We'll see if he wants to draw Nissa. He does, but he doesn't have the land, so instead it's just Corsair. He finds the land on top, but that's a win for Jack. Yeah. Being able to respond to the Nissa immediately, being able to potentially counter it, that, that's a big deal for Jack. It does look like, if you looked at back at Brad's hand, that like he's brought in Plummet for this matchup. Yeah. Uh, well, he does. It is good for him to be able to answer Dragon Lord Ocean time. Yeah, once she starts connecting, things get out of hand quickly. Jack plays a Tismal Backwater, goes up to 19 for the turn. Does not have. We'll see if he wants to answer Brad's card advantage. His hand has Silumgar, Scorn, Heroes, Downfall, Foul Tongue, Invocation. So just three cards that trade. He's going to need an Oshitai or a Dig Through Time. Yeah, and that's why I like Brad bringing in the Plummet, because at the end of the day, Jack doesn't have that much card advantage in the deck. It's just Dig Through Time, Dragon Lord Ojitai, and then some of the contextual stuff, like sometimes Crux of Fate counts and so forth. So uh, being able to actually straight up answer Dragon Lord Ojitai is valuable for Brad. Back over to Brad's side, Drew Nissa. And well, Nissa Drew was drawn last turn. Now he has a Genesis Hydra on top of the deck. He's gotten to keep a Corsair in play. That's, got, that's good for him, and I'm pretty sure he wants this Genesis Hydra as well. Has one in hand, I believe, already. He'll actually go ahead and shuffle away the Genesis Hydra. He wa wants to make sure he gets that extra land. Does check to make sure to see if his Corsair is going to die first. It does not. Gets you can respond to the fetch land activation there, and Brad gets priority once it resolves, so that's your opportunity to do it. Can't wait until the card gets revealed. Let's see, does he find the land? He does. It's a forest. Dang. Well played, Brad. <laughs> and Wooded Foothills is an extra. A lot of good things that does. It means that if Nissa resolves, she gets to make it the 4 4. She makes kind of attack. It continues to build mana toward his Genesis Hydra. I, I think Brad's big plan here, though, is to, to bleed out Jack's answers. This is a huge prize. And he doesn't want to just run that into the jaws of a Dissolve or Slumgar Scorn. So if he can keep pushing on Jack, keep adding to his board and force Jack to respond, when Brad feels like the coast is clear, then he can go for Nissa. You see, he kind of just plays his worst threat first, goes for Pelucranos here. I mean, between cards like Genesis Hydra, uh, a lot of things he has is Pel Pelucranos is the easy to answer one. And there's nothing wrong with Pelucranos, but it takes its five power in play, you know? Yeah. Uh, Brad's playing this with the expectation that it's going to die or get countered, but... If it sticks, all right, cool. You got a 5-5. Five, five. Jack pretty big. lets it resolve, draws for turn, draws a copy of Negate. That's a big draw considering there's a Nissa in, in Brad's hand. Yeah, this allows Jack to be a lot more aggressive using the hero's downfall now because he has a, another answer to Nissa in hand. Brad draws Wooded Foothills. Top card is Nykthos. So Corsair continues to net Brad free cards. And right now, Jack is losing the card advantage game. Yep. Now, Jack can recover with Dig Through Time, and Perilous Vault is always something that Brad has to be concerned about, but... Yeah, Dig Through Time, though, is good. O he needs a Dig Through Time or an Ojitai or something like that eventually. And we know Ojitai right now is no good because of the plummet in Brad's hand. And I'm curious if whether or not how many Dragon Lord's prerogatives Jack has stuck with. If As you go heavier on kill spells, there is a... Sometimes you do bring in some accompanying card draw just to shore up that half of your game plan. Right, you can go kill your stuff, kill your stuff, kill your stuff, draw four cards, kill you with the leftovers. Yep. So it's a, a winning game plan. Trade, 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 draw four, trade, trade, trade is a tried and true magic strategy. And one that Esper can certainly board into.
Near seven mana, you talked about how this was the key number, and again, it looks like it's going to be Genesis Hydra's just being punishing. What this does do, though, is one of Jack's counter spells, I believe, is Silumgar Scorn, and I don't think he has a dragon. So that will be good, at least from Jack's point of view. But, but Brad, you know, he's concerned about sweepers at this point, and if his Genesis Hydra gets tagged by a Force Spike, he's actually happy. It's one less counterspell down the line that matters, and it means that Jack probably doesn't have a sweeper in hand if he's willing to use a counterspell here. So, this Genesis Hydra... Oh, okay, he used Nykthos. That's why it's for six. Nope. Let me say, wait. So it is a 6-6. Six, six. We see Nyssa among the options. It's another way to get her into play for sure. I assure you, if this gets hit by a Slumgar Scorn, and Jack does not have dig through time to follow up at the end of the turn. Brad's actually thrilled with that exchange. He's not mad about losing this big Genesis Hydra to a four spike. No. Xenagos is going to be the card he selects. So Xenagos will go into play. Now we'll see if Jack lets the, the Hydra resolve. These Hydras have just been. I mean, game one, they were great. This game, they're great too. Yeah. I mean, Brad is just punishing him with these two for ones. Jack still has not found Perilous Ball at any point in either game. And. Uh, you can see that he needs that card quite a bit to have a positive matchup. With the, so after the Xenagos resolves, with Genesis Hydra still on the stack, he downfalls the Xenagos, so Brad does not get to use it. And then Silumgar scorns the Hydra, but Jack takes seven. Yeah, that's so still a two-for-one on Brad's side. That's why, you know, Brad is not mad to lose to one-for-ones at this stage. Big draw, though, for Jack. Dig through time was the card for turn. We talked about that. That was what he needs. That, that's his way to muscle his way back in this game. Now, the problem here is we mentioned that Pelucranos, and, and you refer to it as Brad's worst threat, which it is, but Jack's looking at taking five. He took five from it last turn, and he's looking at taking five from it again next turn and dropping to three. Even if Pelucranos is the worst threat at the time, it still hits really, really hard. And Jack needs to answer this and then be able to beat Brad's leftovers, and he may fall to three or lower Mm -hmm. as a result of trying to do all this. Yeah, his card cards are negate, foul tongue invocation, and dig through time. What Brad is doing, and what I like, is that he's forcing Jack to just play a kill spell every turn, so Jack doesn't have time to do things like dig through time. Yep. And Jack, Jack has very little going on in his graveyard, too. He's only got three cards, so dig through time is pretty close to his whole turn. So he'll pass. Brad getting another free card off that courser. It's a forest. Top card, Elvish Mystic. And so now Brad, eight lands in play, two creatures, still has more cards in hand than Jack. And Brad's just done a, a really good job of pushing Jack the whole time without ever getting to a position where Jack has Crux of Fate or Perilous Ball. Brad has no response. What you have to be careful about is that Brad only has two real good threats left. He has one Atarka and one Nyssa. The rest of his cards are Lands and Rattleclaw Mystics. Yeah. But he's still got seven points of damage on the table. Yep. And if he moves into combat and attacks and Jack says, take it, okay, well, uh, you know, you're, you are forcing him to respond to the board and to every follow-up play for the remainder of the game. Another game, though, where Corsair kind of the unsung hero for Brad Nelson. Without it, would have drawn so many more lands. I wonder if Brad is playing this to force the issue on Foul Tongue Invocation or any other Edict effect. His Rattleclaw Mystic. Jack doesn't know that, though. He's got to just hope. I think if you're Jack, you just have to hope this isn't Den Protector. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think he can be that level of attrition at this point. Are not? Yeah, there's one Den Protector on Brad's sideboard. Yeah, if this was Den Protector getting back Genesis Hydra, you're just... You're, you're done. I mean, it's bad news enough that there's a Death Mist Raptor down in, right. in Brad's graveyard here, with Jack likely falling to three inside of combat. Jack forced to have Perilous Vault. I think it's there's just too much attrition so, going on the board. He's only got seven mana in play. I mean, yeah. Perilous Vault's not even in a response here for another two turns at, at, in the best case scenario. And Brad's applying lethal. We're getting very close to it. I feel like Jack needs to get to Crux of Fate, be able to negate the Nyssa, 
and mm -hmm. then go from there. Here's a swing for seven. What Jack can't, I mean, his foul tongue invocation is no good anymore. I think, uh, I honestly think Jack is on, uh, I feel like Jack is on crux of fader bust. You see here an unmoor from Rattleclaw Mystic. That'll make three. Oh, okay, okay. So Brad can force a move here. So Rattleclaw Mystic unmorphs, makes three mana. Nykthos taps for five. Brad uses eight mana to pump Pelucranos three times, and then this attack is ten. Yeah. Not to mention, he can have, he gets he can do it for more because he has death mist. So this just forces a move from Jack immediately. Actually, Jack is I, I believe dead to this play. And right now, Brad's just saying I got a bunch of mana and I got a death mist raptor trigger on the stack. Yep. Does Jack want to respond? Well, the problem is he needs a two mana response because nothing in his hand really does anything, mm -hmm. and dig through time is a five mana spell. It does look like Jack did boarded out of the self-inflicted wounds for this matchup. Yeah. Which is so interesting that you do that against a mono green deck, but it's not its not just necessarily wrong either. Well, I mean, if Jack feels like his life total is an important resource, uh, I feel like you against a deck instance. with a lot of mana acceleration, I would i would kind of put a premium on the cheap stuff, but the, yeah. the edict question in this matchup, how much you're supposed to have to me, is, is pretty complicated. And Brad might just be sensing with the last couple of turns, there might just be something fundamentally wrong with Jack's hand. And even, uh, even if he does have a response here, again, it's another one for one. It's a hero's downfall type of card. Brad can definitely slog his way through that. And uh, the door opens up for Nissa at some point. Just dig through time. I don't think it found anything that Jack can use. And you have it. Brad Nelson, 2-0, defeats Jack Fogel's Esper Dragons deck. So at 11-3, and three, Brad moves one match closer to top eight. Well, two down, two to go. Can he sweep the standard rounds? That's what we'll see. And that's a really brilliant sense of the moment there from Brad because I think he can get an idea that there's something really wrong with Jack's hand because he hadn't really been doing anything. He hadn't made any real promising plays. He was using one-for-one -one answers to things like Genesis Hydra, representing that he had no sweeper. The following turn, Jack gets access potentially to Ugin. And at that point, Brad's follow-ups may not be good enough. So making the